your name? Good morning. Good morning. Could you please take your seats? Good morning. Like everything, we're on a really tight schedule, so I, I, I don't want it to be, I don't want to be responsible for starting late. If we finish late, then that's not my problem. But I don't want to be responsible for starting late. I'm delighted to see you all here. I do apologize, this room is a little warm, but everybody was very unhappy yesterday that they were cold. So we're just going from one extreme to the next. Yes, I do feel a little bit like Goldilocks. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to the third annual conference for ACAME, American College of Academic International Medicine. And um, I'd like to thank President Riley. Without his support, we could have never done this. All these rooms, all the support, our live streaming has all been at the courtesy of our university. In addition to that, they also did give us cash grants. And it's a really wonderful thing to have academic international medicine um, represented in this way and supported. Um, I want to thank IT and a I AV, our facilities, and the fact that they're cleaning up the room so nicely. Um, we had an endless um, effort on the planning committee, but most importantly, the vice president of ACAME, Christina Bloin, did, did a yeoman's job, wrote every proposal, and really deserves a, a round of applause. residency a long time, but that doesn't really count because my residency director is actually here today. He was also my advisor, believe it or not, and I was not the easiest resident to advise in the universe. I know that sounds shocking to people who know me well, um, but he's here on his birthday, and I think that's pretty, pretty unique, and I just lost myself. I think that's pretty unique. Can, Joel Gernsheimer, where are you? He's not in the room yet. <laughs> Happy birthday, Joel. Yeah. So. Um, uh, Luke, can you ask, Ro oh, now it's coming back again. Hello. I'm glad this is happening to me, not to the speakers. Hey, we're not getting, Robert. Robert. Okay. Um, I want to, uh, those of you who are not members, which is uh, the vast majority of the people here today, I want to encourage you to please join a cane. There's a special, there's a special, if the light is on, I'm not going to let this happen to you guys, I promise. Oh, I don't think, yeah. is he coming? Okay, I want to really, um, uh, encourage people who are not members to please join a cane. There's a special discounted membership until tomorrow. There's a special discounted membership until tomorrow. Um, for attendees, it's only $200, which is a $150 de deduction, and it's 50% off for all trainees and everyone else, which we can't get any cheaper than $25. So, um, But now is the time. If you join now, you're actually getting close to 18 months um, membership. The other thing is that those who are members here, please remember to go online. You'll get an email from Christina and vote for the um, officers. Committee meetings, some of them met this morning, but we're also having committee meetings tomorrow morning from 8 to 9, and we strongly encourage you to come to the registration desk, and perhaps you're interested in IT or membership or something else. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say before they introduce is to um, please come to our reception tonight. It's, um, it's at Bergen. You all have drink tickets for it. It's well funded, and we'd love to be able to socialize. So I am going to just stop for a second and make sure that this AV is beautiful, and then we'll let our people introducing go forward. Well, it's not. Is this, it, this is the microphone you want us to use? This is the microphone you want us to use. Okay. This is the clicker. Yes. Eric, Pia, it's up to you guys. You have to be kind. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Dr. Pia Daniel. I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker.
speaker for this morning, Dr. Craig Spencer. Uh, like Dr. Spencer, everybody that I've spoken with this morning has this shared passion for what I think on the surface seems like a really simple idea. Let's deliver healthcare to every member in our community. But the unique thing that ties together Dr. Spencer, myself, all of us, is that we define our community on this global scale. And so now you've taken this simple idea and made a really complicated problem of delivering international health care. Now, Dr. Spencer, he's dedicated his career to facing the challenges that everybody in this room either has faced in the past or is going to come up against in the future in their international work. And the thing is, we all want to do this right, but the right way to do international medicine isn't always clearly defined for us. Luckily, we have people like Craig who are sort of tackling and even defining the issues that we're all really interested in. Like, what does access to medical care look like on a global scale? Uh, what are the human rights that everybody should be having? How do you manage an epidemic? In fighting the Ebola epidemic in Africa, uh, Dr. Spencer actually went from becoming a provider to a patient. And if any of you haven't read his article on that perspective in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's really an amazing piece that shines a spotlight on these tough public health issues that we're definitely going to be coming up against in the future. So to answer the question that really is the mission of this convention or this conference, um, what is international medicine? How do we define it? How do we deliver it on a global scale? I hear Craig actually has the answer to that. <laughs> um, but if you can all actually just join me and welcome Dr. Craig Spencer as he does share his perspective on these issues that we've all come here for this weekend to talk about. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? Good. Hold on. I got to turn it on? Yes. How about now? Cool, great. Let's try again. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? Good morning. Who, whose birthday was it? Have they come back into the room now? Uh, okay. Let me know when he comes in. Kind of, kind of mid-presentation, we can just do a birthday song. Cool. Um, let's get to the meat of this. So thanks for having me. I want to start by telling a story of when I was working in Guinea in 2014. I was there treating patients with Ebola in an Ebola treatment center. And one of the first patients that I was responsible for was this woman who was about 20, 22 weeks pregnant and against literally all of the odds, survived Ebola. Up until then, the treatment algorithm for how to manage a pregnant woman with Ebola basically ends at the part of the algorithm where they're pregnant because there is no treatment after that. Unequivocally, everyone died. So pregnant women uh, almost universally died. This was really, I think, one of the first examples of a woman who was pregnant and survived. And sure enough, she was cured. We still had her in the Ebola treatment center. And we thought, well, we need to do something with this lady. She is a little, uh, she's a little restless. She says, I feel good. I'm no longer infectious. What are you going to do with me? We had no clue um, because there is no algorithm, there is no best practice, there is no science. And so for days we sat around and we talked about what are we going to do with this woman? Anyone have any good ideas? What do you think the big concern is? Um, transmission? Absolutely. Yeah, so this woman had uh, 10 children, most of which were her own and then she was watching some other children, um, had a husband and lived about two to three hours away. Even if, survive, even if she survived Ebola, we knew that the risk for a, a spontaneous miscarriage was extremely high. And what was going to happen if this woman miscarried in her hut two to three hours away? Who was going to clean it up? Probably these 10 children, probably her husband, and then all be exposed. We thought at that time that there was probably some placenta harboring a virus. We didn't really know. We now know that, of course, even after um, 
uh, e even after people resolve the infection, there's still a lot of virus in, in certain places, including the placenta. So we had to make a, we ha we had to make a plan because this woman was getting restless. And we didn't want to send her home. And so what we ended up doing, uh, without any scientific evidence, without any idea about the best way to manage this, is we hired her. Uh, we gave her a job and we said, well, you, you theoretically have antibodies. We're going to take you and we're going to have you responsible for our nursery. So when patients come in and they come in with children and their children aren't infected, we have a little nursery for them. So we said, we're going to have you take care of them because you're the theoretically immunologically protected. And that way, we'll help you build a small structure. We'll have your family move here for the meantime, and we'll be able to watch you throughout your pregnancy. Now, that was a one-off event. That happened to work well in the circumstance. Um, but it certainly was by no means defining a best practice. Every scenario is going to be a little bit different. And so what I want to do today is I want to use three of my personal experiences to highlight how difficult it is to define and how difficult it is to implement best practices. And I'm going to use a little bit more of my experience working with Ebola as a provider and an epidemiologist in Guinea in 2014-2015. I'm also going to talk about time that I spent training uh, trauma physicians in Burundi in their civil war in 2016. And if you don't know where Burundi is, that's okay. I didn't know before I went there the first time either. Um, I'll show you. And we're going to end talking about uh, Mediterranean search and rescue. So the last two summers I've spent on a boat in the Mediterranean providing medical care to migrants who are trying to make the dangerous journey from North Africa to, uh, to Southern Europe. And in each one of those things, I want to talk about one of the, I guess, the defining issues of this problem, defining and implementing best practice. I think my work in, in, in Guinea and the work that we did fighting Ebola is going to show that sometimes there's just a lack of evidence there's a lack of best practices, and it's almost impossible to rely on them if you don't have any. The, my experience in Burundi is going to show that even when you have them, sometimes best practices, depending on your human resources, your clinical resources, and the people that you're working with, might not be best uh, after all. And in the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about what things can or shouldn't we be improvising in global health. That makes sense? Cool. Um, interact, ask questions. I'm going to ask you questions throughout, so don't be, don't be shy. First thing we're going to start with is uh, West Africa Ebola epidemic, what's lacking? And I want to touch on three specific things. Because without these, and I think without all of these, it's nearly impossible to do best practice based anything. You need an adequate workforce, you need adequate financial resources, and you just need guidelines. It's impossible to, give, to, to follow best practice guidelines for how to manage a pregnant woman um, convalescent with Ebola when you don't have any. What I want to do just to start is to make sure everyone uh, remembers the background. This was 2013, the end, December 2013. The first case of Ebola was recognized in this small area right at the confluence of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, a small village called Gekadu. It took many months for people to realize what this actually was. By the time they did, there were cases already in Conakry and in Monrovia, the capitals, these highly you know, dense capitals of these three countries. And almost immediately, we recognized that this was going to be something very different. Um, there was a, a call to arms, an international call to arms, but unfortunately, it was a little inefficient and it was a little too late. I think everyone knows the outcome was 28,000, over 28,000 infections, 11,000 deaths, and pure global havoc uh, at multiple points throughout. Concern on the global security scale of who's going to be infected next and how do we protect ourselves against this worldwide scourge. I showed up there in September of 2014. I went as, uh, as an emergency medicine doctor, as a doctor that had some experience working in personal protective equipment and with um, uh, BSL-3 and BSL-4, um, biosafety level 4 uh, bacteria, uh, viruses. I was there, I was working primarily, you know, 95% of our team were local. Uh, there was this really awesome guy named Dr. Modet, who you'll see a little bit later in this presentation. He was an ID doc at Conakry, the, the big hospital in the middle of the city, uh, the big city. And this is Keita, a younger guy, a general practitioner. And they basically taught me everything that I needed to know about how to take care of Ebola. When we talk about what best practices were in 2014, um, there was not a lot that the, the global community could agree on, whether it was just 
working with patients in situ, so in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, or how we manage them in international destinations. One of the few things that had pretty overall agreement was basically this treatment algorithm or this, this flow algorithm for how we set up Ebola treatment centers. And for anyone that was involved um, or uh, took part in biocontainment units here in the US, you'll see that the, the, uh, the logic is the same. This is something that MSF, Doctors Without Borders, with whom I was working, had done for 14, 15 years and, do pre and did pretty well. The idea is that this whole treatment center was considered an area of, high, uh, of higher risk. Um, as soon as you walked in that center, um, the potential for exposure was, was higher than being outside. And you had to have all precautions. There was no low risk era, area. You walked in, you got changed, and from the time you walked in, you didn't touch anyone um, other than your patients. You didn't hug, you didn't shake hands, you didn't do anything that could potentially transmit virus. And from the time that you walk in until the time that you walk out, you're considered to have been exposed. In this process, you go from taking care of patients with much lower risk, so people that may meet your treatment definition, or your, I'm sorry, your, your admitting definition, but maybe don't have a high exposure or high likelihood of disease, to patients who have been confirmed that you know, may have wet diarrhea, you know, a lot of diarrhea, a lot of vomiting. That was basically where the consensus largely ended. This is just a video from my head cam, so I did a bunch of training videos for people. As I was there in September, the number of cases shot up really, really, really high. This was really the first time that a lot of people recognized what was happening on a global scale. So we started training a lot more people uh, that had never worked with anything like this before. So we had to give them videos to know what it was like inside a treatment center. What this is, this is a decontamination process. This is how it was standardized by Doctors Without Borders. They'd done this for 14, 15 years. They had never had any of their providers become infected. So we thought that this was maybe not 100%, but 99.9999% reliable if you followed these directions correctly. There was a lot of controversy then from other organizations who said this was too strict. This required too many resources. You see, there's this guy here who uh, the guy is talking to me. He tells me everything to do. I've done this process over 200 times. I don't do anything without him telling me what to do. This is a little difficult because I had a camera on my head. He didn't know exactly how to handle this. This was not in his algorithm. But throughout, um, we followed this really strict uh, pathway. Many other organizations uh, developed their own pathways. For many of you that worked here in biocontainment units in the US, we did something completely, completely different. Some people thought that this was too difficult. This was too hard for people that didn't have adequate resources, didn't have access to the personal protective equipment, the Tyvek suits, which cost $80 each. Um, and so many people recommended different modalities. Now I just want to talk a, a little bit more in depth about each one of these, looking first at the health workforce and how it's difficult to design, to implement, and really to, to work with best practices when you're missing multiple of these things. The first one, so Bellevue Hospital, Pia mentioned that um, in 2014 I was working in West Africa. I had the unfortunate displeasure of at one point becoming exposed to the virus, coming back home and falling ill with Ebola. Um, I spent 19 days at this uh, beautiful um, beige colored box in, uh, in Manhattan on the east side. And at that time, and I think still, the number of physicians on staff, uh, according to Bellevue's website, is 1,700, including residents and others. At the exact same time when I was in West Africa, the number of doctors in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone was 1,600 combined, meaning that there were more physicians in one hospital where I was treated in one city, which has another hospital just a couple streets away, than there were in all three of the countries most affected by the Ebola outbreak in 2014 to 2016. I'm not just a physician, I also work as a public health professional, and I think in, in this situation, public health professionals had more of an impact. Um, the number of full-time public health faculty um, in, on the whole African continent is actually less than the number in one school in one city that has two other public health schools. So from a health workforce, either from a direct clinical care or also from a public health workforce capacity, human resources were, were largely non-existent. Through the Ebola epidemic, um, one out of eight, I'm sorry, 8% 8 of physicians in Liberia died 
um, because they were infected. Um, it was around 4% in Guinea and 6% in Sierra Leone. So an already short workforce um, was decimated. It's nearly impossible in that situation to try to develop best practices. Um, we were telling people to wash your hands and to follow decontamination procedures and giving them PPE for centers that just didn't have running water. And so this was a big issue. Resources, both financial, I'm sorry, both human resources as well as structural didn't exist. It wasn't just human resources, um, it was also financial resources. So I work at New York Presbyterian, which many uh, I'm sure of you know. It's a large hospital system here, uh, largely in New York. Does anyone know what the budget is for New York Presbyterian? Take a guess. Three billion? You think higher? I would higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the budget for New York Presbyterian is uh, 5.6 billion. What do you think the budget is for the World Health Organization, the organization responsible for the health of every single human being on the face of the earth is? Do you think it's less or more? Less. Clearly it's less, otherwise I wouldn't be making this point. Yeah, it's about $4.3 billion. Uh, meaning that the one hospital system where I work, which does amazing work and has amazing outcomes, um, has more money than the organization responsible for running Ebola and non-communicable disease and all technical guidelines and being an operational partner in every single country. Um, so financial resources, there is a lot to give, um, a lot to be angry about with the way WHO responded to the West African Ebola epidemic in terms of their inefficiency and the political response. But part of the problem was that a big part of their staff had been cut, 25% of their pandemic response unit had been cut. There were positions that just weren't filled because there wasn't the resources. There had been a shift to non-communicable diseases uh, because budgeting for things like the World Health Organization come from donor countries and donor countries are ones with money and ones with money have bigger issues or bigger concerns in things like hypertension and cardiovascular disease and less in things like global health security. All right, so human resources, financial resources were huge. One of the big problems also with um, using, defining, and implementing best practice was that, frankly, there just wasn't any. I mentioned that for this pregnant woman that we took care of, there wasn't, there wasn't an algorithm, there wasn't a, a treatment idea. We had to talk and make it up ourselves. Everyone that uh, took care of Ebola patients through Doctors Without Borders had to go do a mandatory training in Brussels for a few days. And I remember this was the medical management. And I remember that this was the medical management for breastfeeding mothers. We knew that we probably wouldn't see all that money, uh, all that many, but the idea was step, stop breastfeeding and then give them a breast pump and artificial milk. End of the story. So about two days after we discharged this woman um, that, I, that I spoke about earlier, the, the pregnant woman, we had a woman come in who said, I don't feel well, I haven't felt well for the past three to four weeks. I've had some fevers, I've had vomiting, I've had diarrhea. She had all these symptoms and she showed up with her nine month old son. Her nine month old son was asymptomatic, no fever. Um, the woman that we had discharged to be responsible for the nursery took his temperature and took care of him. And he was doing perfectly fine, so we put him in the nursery. We put the mom inside the Ebola treatment center, we tested her, her blood was negative on day one, her blood was negative on day two, so we said, we don't know what you got, but it's not Ebola, we're gonna send you home. Just then, someone comes in and says, hey, this woman's baby has a fever. So we talk to her and say, we're gonna to have to test him, do you wanna stay in? We'll bring him in and then we'll test, and if it's negative, you can go home. So we did a test on the baby, and the baby was Ebola positive. Um, how many people do you think an infant hangs out with? Not that many, right? Especially a breastfeeding infant. Hangs out basically with its mom. And so we were trying to think, how did this kid get infected? And so we went back and we thought about what are the other possibilities? Is it possible that this woman had Ebola at home, wrote it out, infected her kid and just came in because she was still not feeling great? So we tested her blood, it was negative twice. One of the guys that I was working with, Dr. Modet, who I showed you early on said, I wonder what happens if we test the urine? He had this idea and he thought, you know, fragments, RNA fragments, maybe they break down slower in the urine or they're kept around. This is before we knew a lot of the science. Um, and sure enough, we tested this woman's urine, the mother's urine, and she had RNA fragments. She was Ebola positive in her urine. So she had convalesced at home. She had infected her child. And then she insisted on staying in with her child and she insisted on breastfeeding. 
because we gave artificial milk like we were supposed to and the kid didn't like it and the mom said this is inhumane. So then what do we do? Clearly we're gonna follow what the mom wants to do but we had to have some guidance. Who thinks there's an upside potentially to a convalescent Ebola um, survivor breastfeeding their child? Right, yeah, we know that it happens with influenza. Um, there's a couple other things like you get IgA antibodies. Like we think that it's secreted in the breast milk but we didn't know. We tested her breast milk and her, her breast milk had RNA fragments, but probably also had antibodies. We didn't know. So we didn't know what to do. Um, this woman ultimately didn't let us decide. She said, I'm going to breastfeed my kid. I don't care what you guys want. Um, unfortunately, the, the child, much like many children under one, um, ended up dying um, about seven or eight days later. Um, but there was nothing, there was, there was nothing about this at all in the literature. We published a report um, looking at the fact that lactating mothers with Ebola virus doing just PCR in their blood might not be enough. So we were trying to define what the best practice was. But the other thing I think, which is unfortunate, is if you look at the number of people that are on this, this presentation, I'm sorry, on this paper, there's only one of them, Dr. Modet, um, who is from Guinea, who's local. Um, the rest are people like myself from fancy places in Europe and the US who were there for six weeks, eight weeks, and then came back and actually had the time to write something like this and submit it and bring it through peer review. When people like Dr. Modet were working 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week, basically throughout the whole uh, crisis. And it didn't end there. Things like whether we should be breastfeeding or whether we should be discharging pregnant women. One of the most controversial, I think most heated arguments around best practices for Ebola was around IV therapy. Does anyone remember hearing about this? There were a couple organizations, Doctors Without Borders and Partners in Health and the WHO, and they all had this big fight about what we should be doing. What, are, what is our best practice for Ebola treatment care? And MSF said, we know what works. We've been doing this for 14, 15 years. We know we can decrease mortality from 90, 80%, somewhere to down 40 to 50% with, um, with antiemetics, with symptomatic treatment, with antibiotics, with antimalarials. And for patients that need an IV, putting an IV. Whereas other organizations said, everyone basically needs an IV. We need liberal use of IV fluids. Electrolyte deficiencies are huge. Like, this is what we need to do. What, this is important to contextualize because I was here at the time that this controversy came up. The big issue was, whereas I was treated at Bellevue Hospital and there were approximately 35 to 40 specialists on call for me at any time, um, I was routinely taking care of 30 to 40 people at a time, sometimes more. And the issue was that we had approximately one to two minutes um, of quality time with every patient. And as you can imagine, or perhaps maybe not, um, putting in an IV uh, in uh, a PPE with two gloves when it's extremely hot takes a lot of time and a lot of planning. And so that was the big issue. We thought that Number one, just like when you, when you teach disaster response or wilderness response, the first step is not rush in, it's scene safety. What can you do that makes sure that you, you don't get put in, in a difficult environment? What makes sure that you, you stay safe? The big issue or the, you know, the big concern for most organizations were we wanted to make sure that our providers didn't get infected and then were able to provide care. And this video is just um, a short clip of how difficult it is to put in an IV. So I work in an emergency room. I've been an emergency doctor for over a decade. Every single shift that I work, I put in at least one IV to make my nurses happy and to keep my skills up. Um, I have put in hundreds, thousands of IVs. For the first two days that I was in West Africa, I was horrible. I couldn't do it, I missed. It, it just was, I couldn't do it because I was so afraid. I blamed it on the gloves. I blamed it on all these other things. But it was such a laborious process that was really so scary in my mind because I knew that if I got hit, if I had a needle, a needle stick, my mortality was 100%. Not my infection rate, not my likelihood of getting Ebola, my mortality was 100%. And so this process takes a really, really long time. We put an IV once on a 12-year-old kid who was altered. Um, after we put the IV in, he pulled out the, um, the needle and was waving it around and almost hit myself and the guy that I was working with. And it was at that time that we recognized that it might not be the safest and smartest thing to be trying to do this on everyone that needs it. And we're gonna to have to figure out who are people that are gonna need it the most. Just as a, a, a side, 
when I was admitted to Bellevue Hospital, um, the first day that I was there, they were trying to put in an IV. The woman that was taking care of me was an ICU nurse. She had 20-something uh, years of experience working in the ICU. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that she could put an IV in an orange, like this woman was incredible. Um, and she missed three separate times. Um, and I'm not that difficult to get access on. She missed twice and then hit a nerve on the third time. Um, so I think it just goes to show preparation is only so much. We can talk about what's, what best practices are, but when you're actually there, unless you're actually there, you might not understand what the difficulties are in implementing them. All right, so we talked about some of the human resources, the financial resources, and really the technical resources that might not exist and might make it difficult. The next thing I wanna talk about is the Burundian Civil War and my experience there and when maybe best isn't best. So this is Burundi, this is this tiny little country down here. Uh, it is just south of Rwanda. It's much wealthier and more developed neighbor, although people speak the exact same language, have the exact same climate and culture and basically everything else. And I was working at this hospital. Um, we were a, a trauma hospital in the middle of the city in Bujumbura. There was political violence. Um, grenades were being thrown. People were being shot in the street. Um, it's a place that I've known well. I've lived a year or a year and a half of my life in Burundi, so I knew it very well. Um, and it was unlike anything that I'd ever seen. What would happen is, although most of the time it was calm, um, generally in the early evening, um, at the market, when people at the market, either the government or the rebel forces would throw a grenade into a market. Um, many people would be killed or injured, and whoever wasn't um, killed initially, um, military targets or military would come in and target people, survivors. And so we would get within the span of a couple minutes 60 to 80 um, severely injured people, and we had to do a really good job of triage. This was the structure that we had set up to take care. Uh, so this is our yellow tent and this was our, our green tent to take care of multiple people at a time. When I showed up, uh, I got a three-month visa. We knew that there would be no more visas. The government was very angry with our organization, refused to give other visas. So basically, I had a three-month mandate to teach trauma to a bunch of uh, like seven Burundian doctors who had mostly just graduated medical school, didn't have much postgraduate education because the country was in crisis. And I joke but it is largely true. When I showed up, the ABCs of trauma were give the patient antibiotics, take a short break, and then send them for chest x-ray 15, 20 minutes across the city. Um, because they just hadn't had any training. I don't know if anyone knows, but um, it's nearly impossible to get a copy of the ATLS manual without paying a bunch of money. You can kind of piece together things about how you manage ABCs of trauma, um, but it's pretty difficult. One of the big issues that we had initially was we had an ultrasound. And I said, I'm gonna teach these guys how to use ultrasound. I've taught ultrasound in the US. I feel really good as an EM doc, uh, being able to do fast ultrasound for trauma. The problem was is that when I trained in most of the training modalities that exist, assume that the overwhelming majority of cases that you're gonna see are normal, are negative scans. So we'll have, you know, who's, an EM, who's a resident? Is anyone an EM resident? Yeah. How often do you see positive fasts? Maybe more here, but not, would you say 50% of the time? 10% of the time? Maybe a little less. And that's, that was my experience, and so I thought that's how I was gonna train uh, my, my physicians. 90 something percent of the time, we had positive fasts. And so the hardest problem for me was to try to explain to them what a normal fast looked like. They would do it on me, and they got sick of looking at my kidneys. So I had to redevelop and you know, really the best practices for training even on ultrasound, and I knew I only had a couple months. Any of the residents, you know what this is? It smells really bad. Perfect, yeah. This is necrotizing fasciitis. This was someone that had an injury that was treated at an outside hospital and was transferred to us. Um, when I first saw this, I was horribly concerned, of course. Um, it smelled like nothing I'd ever smelled. Um, and I worked with our surgeon. This guy ended up getting uh, a really high amputation. One of the issues we had, of course, is that this had lingered for a while and we had to treat this man's sepsis. He was septic, unsurprisingly. And what are the sepsis guidelines that we all use? There's a bunch now, right? I mean, like. Manny Ravens has fallen by the wayside, there's, you know, there's this, maybe a early goal-directed therapy or antibiotics or just fluid hydration, whatever it may be. We didn't have any of that. 
This gentleman unfortunately went into renal failure, became hyperkalemic, um, and the team that I was working with, because, just because they had no experience with it, didn't really know how to provide insulin um, to, to, to treat hyperkalemia. They knew how to use it for, for sugar, but they'd never done it for management of hyperkalemia. So even very basic protocols that are best practice protocols, we didn't have the resources or really the training for to use and implement here in the trauma hospital that we were running. And I think what was probably the hardest decision for me was that I knew within the, in the last month that I was there, I would be leaving soon and we started seeing a lot of, uh, a lot more head trauma. And when I was there, I was able to intubate patients but I knew that I would be gone. And I thought, well, I have seven different physicians and for each of them to get skilled at intubating, each one of them is gonna to need to do a few dozen of these at least. And that's just not gonna happen. What I knew I could do is I could train them on how, on how to do um, a surgical airway um, and how to do a crike. And so every single day we practice surgical airways um, because I knew, unfortunately, this was the only way that they were gonna be able to manage an airway without getting all of the training that we have the luxury of receiving here, you know, working in anesthesia or working intubating in the ED. So this was one tough, that was a really difficult decision, but knowing the constraints, knowing that it'd be a single provider who wouldn't be able to hold C-spine uh, mobilization, knowing that they weren't gonna have someone else to help them um, in the event that um, they missed an intubation. This was, um, this was the best, even though this is not by any means the best. All right, so just to summarize fr from there, some of the best practices that we have in terms of managing sepsis or how we train residents or providers or even some of the things that we take for granted, the A of ABCs, were in many ways flipped on their head in some of the environments and it was really difficult to implement what we consider best practice. The last thing I want to talk about is just the Mediterranean, I'm checking on my time, um, the Mediterranean uh, search and rescue. So again, I was working with um, an organization, Doctors Without Borders, in the, in the waters of the Mediterranean between Libya and Italy. Um, just as a little bit of background, in case you don't know, the number of people on the move currently is the highest it's ever been. There are 66 million people who have been forced from their home. Um, a few dozen uh, million of those are refugees, people that have crossed the border and are seeking protection. Um, tens of millions of those are people that are trapped in their country fleeing violence or conflict. And this is where we were, we were at. We were based out of Sicily. If you guys haven't heard over the past couple of years, there's been a, a huge influx of people largely from the Middle East, but also from West Africa um, into Libya and the north where people came for a really long time for jobs and, and for training um, with no way to get out and then have been forced into the water. Um, these people will get put out on really small dinghies, you know, really unseaworthy boats, many of them drowned. Um, just this past month has been the highest recorded number of drownings, um, I guess, in history on the Mediterranean. And so our organization was out there to provide search and rescue and also to provide medical assistance. Um, I lived on this 77, 77 meter beauty. I had never really been on a boat before or a ship. I didn't know if I got seasick. Um, I found out I don't get seasick unless I drink two cocktails before I get on the boat. Um, you're not allowed to drink on a boat. No one told me that. Um, it just doesn't mean you can't bring drinks on the boat inside of you. So we all, I, it was a bunch of sailors um, and they do live up to their reputation. So we worked on this boat. Um, can anyone see anything in this picture? Yeah, so if you look right on the, right on the horizon, my little clicker ain't working. Yeah, right on the horizon you see a small little white blip. And that was basically what we were looking for. That little white blip looks like this, when you, when you get closer. How many people do you think are on that boat? Good guess. I've heard some, some dozens, up to 100, 200. There's about 140 people on that boat, 150 people. Um, and you're only seeing part of the boat. What you see are primarily men um, sitting on the outside. That's because um, women and children are meant to be protected in the middle so inside there, there's just as many people that are stuck in the middle. Um, obviously, it's a protected place in some ways, but it's also dangerous. You can get trampled on. And the big issue is that gasoline from the motor mixes with the seawater and becomes very permeable and seeps into the skin. And we'll talk about that in a minute. 
in terms of triage, if you had to find, if you asked who on this boat is sick, what do you think is going to happen? Everyone, everyone is sick. Every single person is going to raise their hand. So one of the big issues that we had early on is how do you find really the sickest person? Because the sickest person isn't going to talk. The sickest person is at the bottom. And we developed a protocol um, where we would ask certain questions, where we would relay certain information back to our boat, how many people are on it, whether the boat looked like it was sinking, whether there was a smell of fuel, how many women and children, whether there was any people that we couldn't see. So we would do a circle around the boat to see if there's anyone that we couldn't visualize. And if there's anyone we couldn't actually visualize, we would ask people in the boat to, to make them visible. We would get um, sick people off, uh, sick people off first, then children, and then women. And that process generally took the better part of a day because it's a slow, delicate process. And then we would start seeing patients in our clinic. We would triage them immediately as they came on the boat, um, a visual triage to see who was weak, who, who just didn't look well. And then for any other, uh, any other issues, we would emergently manage. Um, a lot of drowning, of course, um, a lot of people with fuel burns, which we'll talk about. We had a clinic, I was working with uh, this guy, Tim. He has been a nurse for 41 years um, out of Boston. He would always ask me, what do you want to do about this patient? And I would always say to him, you've been doing this longer than I've been alive. What do you think we should do about this patient? It's absolutely incredible. Um, but we would, we, would, we would have to find on a boat of maybe 800 or 1,000 people the three or four sickest people that need intervention immediately or otherwise might die. A lot of what we did was listen to people's stories, stories of rape and torture and abuse. Um, I spent a couple hours with a 16-year-old boy who had miliary TB, um, and he told me his whole story of when he left home uh, at 15 and going across the desert and the times he was kidnapped and the times he was sold and the times he was shot at and the times he saw other people die. In terms of Im Im improvisation, I mean, obviously being on a ship, you don't have a lot of resources. Um, we had ceftriaxone, we had flagell, um, we had some ampicillin if necessary, but not a lot. Um, we didn't really have a lot, so we had to improvise. Some things were as simple as, it's the first time I've ever hang, uh, hung a, bottle, uh, a liter of um, LR from a porthole. Some of the other things had more established ways that we managed them. So this is uh, a picture of a boy's hands. He was tied up uh, in Libya and tortured. Um, to try to extract ransom from his family. And there are certainly um, algorithms and protocols for how we manage uh, victims of torture, both for their physical as well as their mental, um, the mental impact. I was talking to you earlier about the, the fuel burns, the mix of um, gasoline and water that can seep and often seeps into the buttocks or to the back of the buttocks. And very, very quickly, this causes a really nasty chemical burn that has to be addressed immediately, has to be washed off, and has to get good wound care. There are certainly um, best practices for how we manage wounds themselves, chemical burns, um, but I'd never, seen a, I'd never seen a gasoline burn like this. And we had to be really careful to make sure that we identified people as soon as they came on the boat. Um, we had one of the guys I was working with was a German ICU nurse. Um, he loved the fact that he was the most stereotypically German person. Um, he loves doing everything the exact same way every single time. And it was his job to shake everyone's hand, look them in the eye, and smell their butt. Every single person, thousands and thousands of people, this guy smelled their butt. And he probably, they probably thought this was like some weird Western ritual. They're probably going around <laughs> smelling people's butts. It's like, all right, well, this guy does it. So every single person, we have to smell to see if they had any gas on them. Because if they did and we didn't catch it immediately, they would come back you know, a day or two, day, two days later with these really nasty burns. And so this took up a big part of our time. We had to develop our own best practices for how to manage this, especially at sea, and how we refer them. I think one of the, the more difficult things that we kind of had to improvise was doing transfers and doing rescues. So this is us being called to a tanker um, to pick up around 700 or 800 people that had been rescued in the middle of the night and needed uh, medical care and needed transfer. So I want you to imagine you step on this boat this isn't, this isn't our boat, but this is basically like what we jumped on. You step on that boat and it's full of 800 people underneath hypothermia blankets. So it just looks like a sea of, of golden blanket. What would you do? How would you find the five sickest people? The people with a heart rate of 140, the people that are likely gonna die either of dehydration or hypothermia or whatever it may be. Any ideas? 
What do you think? Sure. Yeah, so that's exactly what we did. We got on and we just had every single person stand up. It was five o'clock in the morning. The sun was just starting to come up. Um, and so we just got in and we slowly went around and made every single person stand up. And through that process, we found the five people who were the sickest, who couldn't stand up and who were really unwell. So we were able to do that within about 20 minutes and then we were able to proceed with the rest of the rescue. Um, unsurprisingly, PubMed has zero articles on how to triage migrants at sea. Um, I looked this up. It also has basically nothing on how do you provide medical care to people at sea. How do you provide medical care um, to people who have been you know, victims of, uh, of violence on a boat? There's really no protocols for this. So a lot of this was imp improvisation. This was what happened when we got, a people, uh, got people on board. We'd have a thousand people. And we wanted to do the same thing. How do we find the sickest people? And what we ended up coming up with was we just created a food line where we had every single person stand up and they snaked around a thousand, imagine a thousand people snaking around, you know, a couple hundred feet of a boat. And that's exactly what we did because we knew every single person, this was our, our biggest medical intervention. We knew every single person that had been in detention for the past six months was likely very hungry. If you don't stand up to get food, there's a problem. And if you can't stand up on your own, there's a big problem. And so invariably, 95 or 98 percent of the times uh, of the people that we ended up referring for medical treatment or required emergent treatment we found through this process and so this was our biggest medical intervention this is the german nurse this is my my friend tim and we would have one person just go around follow people and kind of mop up the end and see who wasn't getting up and who wasn't eating the other thing that we had to improvise was at night how to tell who was sick this one was uh was a lot easier, although it took us quite a while to get to it. Most of these people know each other or have been traveling each other or know their friends really well, just like you know your social network really well. In the middle of the night, what we would do would be on deck watch and we would go and try to find people who are sick. And we didn't want to wake every single person up. So if we saw one person in this group that was awake or moving around, we would ask him, hey, are any of your friends not doing okay? And invariably, they would say, oh yeah, my friend over here, he unfortunately is not doing so good. And sure enough, we'd examine them. They'd have a heart rate of 140, you know, a temperature of 104. Um, and so we used really our extended social network of patients to do medical triage for us. And that's something that we had to improvise and took a lot longer to come up with than just this process or this process. Um, and then I think there are just some things that unfortunately you, uh, there is no basis for. There is no improvisation for. Um, there's just, we got to do. So we were on one of these, uh, we were on one of our tours going around a boat um, and we saw this woman in distress and this woman ended up delivering her first child um, unaccompanied in the middle of the Mediterranean. Um, she still connected the, we hadn't delivered the placenta yet. And everyone looked at me and said, all right, what do we do? And I said, I have no frigging clue. <laughs> like I have, no one trained me in my third or fourth year of medical school about how to deliver a baby on a boat. No one told me in my residency about what we need to do. That's just something that hadn't come up. Um, thankfully, because of our training, I think um, my training as an emergency medicine physician and having some experience, we were able to figure out the best thing. But there's many, many things to consider here. This is a woman that just gave birth, and it may not look like it, but this ladder is about 15 feet up, and there's no other way up. So how are you going to get this woman up? She's still connected to the placenta. Do you deliver the placenta in the boat? What about the potential of uterine rupture or postpartum hemorrhage? It's a lot easier to move a woman when she's not bleeding, so do we do that first? And the other thing I thought of, well, now this woman is in the middle of the sea, but our boat is under the flag of Gibraltar, so if this baby in this placenta gets delivered on our boat, they become uh, you know, a citizen of, of the E. Like, I'm thinking of all of these things and trying to improvise the moment, and, and thankfully, we're able to get this woman up. We're able to cut the cord. The mom and the baby did extremely well, but I think this just shows that even if we define um, and try to implement best practices. Sometimes there are things that are just gonna throw us for a loop and we can't prepare for. So at the end, I just wanna just to wrap up and say, some of the big issues that we talked about in terms of defining and implementing best practices are, in many of the places that we work, the resources are just not the same. The human resources, the financial resources. Another big issue is that mo most of the research agenda is driven by Westerners um, people you know, in this room or in the city that have NIH funding or have larger funding. And 
they propose the research questions and this is how research gets done, just like the article that I showed you that I was published on that had one local um, and 58 other um, researchers. This is because the majority of the funding comes from here and that's, um, that is the way our research institution has worked. Um, but I think that there needs to be a bigger focus on local, locally identified problems, local solutions, um, and building from the bottom up. And I know it sounds like it makes common sense, it's common sense, but that's the exact opposite of what's being done, unfortunately. Um, financial resources for organizations like the World Health Organization that are responsible for the health of every human on this face of the earth. Um, and, and also smaller organizations need to be, need to be changed. Um, sometimes, like I showed in Burundi, sometimes imposition of best practices, especially in developing countries or places where resources don't exist, sepsis guidelines, etc., might end up doing more harm than good. And we need to think about how they can be tailor-made to best educate and to improve clinical outcomes for people um, in a local, you know, contextually specific way. Um, and then sometimes, unfortunately, there, there are no best practices and we just need to improvise, but we need to do that and make sure we do it well. That's it, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Thank you. On the... Yeah. Get a little drink. Yeah. On behalf of the team, I'd like to uh, thank, thank you very much and oh. give you this little token. Thank you. And another round of applause. He'll thank be you. around to answer the questions. Great. Keep looking good. Um, Luke, can Thank we you. have Dr. Riley's video now? I'm right here. Okay. Oh, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you know. so much. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how long I talked for. Oh, perfect. Oh, my gosh. Nailed it. Perfect. I've done, I've done it a couple times. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. That's what I thought I think. I think it was on time.
Well, thank you for uh, being here, and uh, we love the keynote. It was, it was awesome, very inspiring, and thank you for being here and, and sharing uh, your, your, your presence with us and, and your wisdom and experiences, which are just incredible. Um, thank you. I'm Stan Stowicki, and I'm uh, the past president of uh, Cain. So what we decided last year is that uh, uh, to kind of you know, create a little bit of a legacy and continuity, the past president would invite uh, the second keynote speaker, the past president speaker, and uh, I'm very pleased to uh, announce that uh, Dr. Gorgas, Dr. Dan Gorgas, agreed graciously to be here today and to give us a wonderful uh, past president's talk. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Gorgas because uh, I do have a personal connection as a faculty member at Ohio State University where I started my academic career. So I still remember that first tough call that I had. And I was there for maybe two, three weeks. And it was one of those where, you know, it's trauma after trauma, and I'm a trauma surgeon. Uh, and, and of course, our team uh, down in the trauma bay uh, is, is, is multidisciplinary. So we have ER docs uh, who show up to every single trauma and manage the airway. And in our absence, kind of manage the entire trauma until we show up. And this was one of those where, you know, we had a tough trauma after tough trauma. And then, and then, uh, uh, there was a shift change in the ER, and uh, I still remember this, this patient basically came in coding. And we happened to be, I don't know if you remember that or not, but it, it's still in my memory. Um, we were down there, and, and we were the team. I was, I was the third week attending, you know, fresh into my career, and Dr. Gorgas, who was there. And uh, uh, it was one of those situations where no one really knew what to do, you know. Do we do ED thoracotomy? Do we start, you know, some kind of heroic measure? Do we start operating in the ER? Do we take the patient to the OR? Uh, you know, and, and, and in, in all of that, a bit of a mess emerged. And I still remember when Diane came into the trauma bay and became this kind of beacon of wisdom and put us all into the proper perspective. We started getting back to the basics of APCs and Ds and Es and managed to stabilize the patient. And, uh, you know, at that point I knew she's a leader. She came in to a situation that was a total mess, was able to get everybody on the same page. And by no means can I take any credit for that. And because of that presence and the wisdom and really the leadership that she continues, as you'll see, uh, from her bio description that I'm about to give, um, continues throughout her career, was able to get everything done, everybody was fine, the patient lived, and we're all better for it. So, uh, with that said, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Gorgas's amazing career. Uh, and I'm going to read a little bit here because it's very, very long, but I don't want to miss anything. So, um, she's professor of emergency medicine, at the Ohio State University Medical Center, Wexner Medical Center. Um, a wonderful, wonderful academician. Um, she's also the executive director of the Office of Global Health for the medical school. She graduated in 1990 from Case Western. Then she did her residency in emergency medicine at University of Cincinnati, and then joined the faculty of the Ohio State University. She's a national figure in emergency medicine, a member of the American Board of Emergency Medicine, for which she actually, uh, I, I think you would still continue to write questions and board exam scenarios, but that's how she started the engagement with the Board of uh, Emergency Medicine. <coughs> um, she also is part of the HCGME uh, residency review group for emergency medicine. Um, but she's also a, a great member of the Columbus community. Um, a lot, of, a lot of wonderful pieces that, that are meant to educate the public and, and kind of bridge the gap between the medical community and the local community on common medical problems. I always read your column in the newspaper. Thank you for doing that and continuing to do that. She's also active in the WOSU community as a, uh, a regular broadcast feature um, on uh, common health problems and emergency problems. So, uh, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gorgas, and I'd like to again express our gratitude for her coming here, and uh, 
given us this past president's talk. Thank you. Well, is the, is this mic on? Take the handheld hand mic after all. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction, Dr. Stowicki. And um, wow, it's been an it's been a fantastic morning already, uh, Dr. Spencer. Thank you so much for your great talk. That uh, that's going to be a hard act to follow. There will be no pictures of births at sea in my talk. I promise you. Um, but uh, pretty incredible stuff. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'd just like to get a little bit of an idea of who is in the audience. So who out there um, are non-healthcare providers? Okay, welcome. Um, and, and who are um, academic faculty at a, at a training center or um, college of medicine? Possibly the majority then, fabulous. Do we have any directors of global health out there? Wonderful. And um, residents or trainees or students, that group? Wonderful. And, and of those who didn't raise their hands that their directors are of global health, um, do we have those that maybe are aspiring to that position as well in the audience? We'll go with undecided for all of those. <laughs> hands that weren't raised. Um, it, it truly is a, uh, a, a great and a very rewarding experience, so I would encourage all of you to think about it. Uh, so today really I'm going to be talking about, from an academic um, point of view, um, what do we need to do to advocate for ourselves as global health leaders and for international medicine at our institutions? Um, like we're all in this room because we have a passion for global health and likely we share a feeling that global health is undervalued in our current um, uh, environments, whatever that may be, from a, an aspect of funding, time, attention in the curriculum, or even personal recognition for your work. Um, what can we do to increase the value of global health within those arenas? Um, ultimately, I'd like you all to at least take one point home with you that you can translate or add into your own elevator speech. So when you're with the dean for that 15 seconds of an elevator ride, that you can advocate for global health in your setting. So who is your dean? And there, there are lots of deans in academic medicine. Um, I'm, I'm talking about kind of dean with a capital D here. Which, but which of the deans do you personally report to? Is it an undergraduate dean? Is it a graduate dean or a designated institutional officer of your, uh, your facility that's an associate dean if you work on the graduate level? When was the last time you sat down with her or him, no matter what your role is in the university, to advocate for global health. What's her or his understanding of what the university's global health program is? How is it valued? And maybe can we give them some information about it? So when we think about what do deans of academic medical centers do, um, even though it appears that their brain is 90% focused on funding, it is actually 90% focused on these five different areas that then translate into um, financial solvency for the institution. Um, these five different areas really help predict the dean's success and make the board of trustees in, in, uh, in turn very happy. Um, each of these has a component in the medical school rankings, either directly or indirectly. So what are the markers of excellence in these areas? Um, I, I can already see the internal eye rolling from all of you when I put up uh, uh, the best hospitals of the US News and World Report rankings. 
Do we hate this ranking or what? But it is a common communication and a common value that deans hold. So despite the eye rolling, we're going to kind of dissect this a little bit and talk about ultimately what is global health's role in those rankings and how do we advocate for global health to improve those rankings. So is there a link between uh, the US News and World Report's rankings and financial solvency? Um, yes, absolutely there's a ranking or there's a link between the two of them. But most importantly, you may say, well, is there a link to patient outcomes? Does having a higher ranking, either on the research or the primary care scale, mean that you deliver better patient care? What do you think? Yes? No? Yeah, so it's a little bit of a catch-22 here in that the ranking doesn't in and of itself predict better patient care, but the volumes that the ranking subsequently imparts to the institution make b for better patient outcomes. Is there a link to provider success? Well, for as much weight as we put on these rankings, there is very little evidence out there that it makes a difference. And you can always make an argument, is this a causative link or is it an associative link? So. Um, uh, lots of areas for opportunity of study in, the, in both of these categories. So is it the holy grail? I, I think that there's been enough public opinion out there and opinion within academic medical centers out there that it's probably not the holy grail. It, it may better represent this emoji. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, Let's look at it as kind of a template that we can use to advocate for our own passion and our own interest. There are actually two US News and World Report uh, sets of rankings. One is on research and one is on primary care. And these are the components of those that make up each of those rankings. Reputation is a peer assessment from one dean to another or from ACGME accredited program directors from one institution to the other. It's a, it's a composite between the two of those. Funding is pretty straightforward. It's NIH funding, non-NIH funding, um, and also non-federal funding is put into this. And it's not only absolute numbers of funding for the university or for the medical center, it's per capita, so it's per faculty member. The next category that they look at in decreasing ordinance is student selectivity, and it's based solely on a GPA and MCAT scores. And subsequently, faculty resources is the least weighted in the research. And by faculty resources, what they mean is number of faculty per number of medical students. So it's a pure ratio. In the primary care rankings, there's one additional factor added in there, and that's the percentage of medical students matching in primary care. So when we think about these five different things that, that are in the dean's mind that occupy 90% of her or his um, daily work function, how does global health or international medicine impact on these. So going back to our list, we're going to ask kind of how have we leveraged the literature and local resources to justify your programs, expand your offerings, or make a case that you need seed fundings or that some of the global health work that we're doing deserves to be part of promotion and tenure in and of itself. Okay, so education. What do we know about global health and the opportunities of global health and their impact on improving a medical school's uh, selectivity or MCAT or GPA scores? Uh, I think any of you who have been involved with uh, medical student recruitment know that this is a big satisfier and something that students are looking for. Um, up to 80% and nationwide it's about 70% of students say that having a global health 
opportunity or a global health experience in their training is a key point in deciding where they're going to match for or where they're going to um, enroll for medical school. How do uh, students gauge a university's interest or a university's commitment in global health? Typically through web pages, through current student opinions or attestations via social med uh, media or face-to-face, -face, presence of global health fellowships, and these can be really powerful recruitment tools, both at the undergraduate and at the graduate level, but at especially at the graduate level, this is an area that really has not been studied. A prospective student's opinion is shaped, um, as we mentioned, by the experience of current students, and that their experience is largely based on the strength of the curriculum. In this area, we know that there's been a lot more robust undergraduate study, and by that I mean medical school, um, or the medic at the medical student level, than at the graduate, graduate or residency level. The benefits of a well-designed undergraduate global health curriculum have shown improved skills, improved attitudes when it comes to cultural competency, and we'll talk about that a little later, and, and also improved medical knowledge. Many undergraduate students state that their global health experience is, is one of the most formative experiences that they have during their entire medical education. At the graduate level, there's a lot more heterogeneity in global health curricula, and there's really no single strategy for teaching global health to graduate medical learners. Uh, the quality of the literature in this is really marginal, and the body of work overall doesn't facilitate assessment of education or clinical benefit of the global health experiences. What we do know is that um, involvement with global health definitely can impact the number of students going into primary care. So who knows Dr. Bruno? There we go. Down, uh, here at Downstate, um, Dr. Bruno really looked at the regards to primary care rankings. And in the study, students who took part in a global health experience chose primary care careers 57% of the time, as opposed to a national average around 39% and a local average of 44%. The authors didn't really argue whether this was a causative relationship or just an association, but from a ranking point of view, does it matter? If you are recruiting students and if students are able to explore their area of passion throughout their training, um, then it can directly impact the primary care ranking for a school. An outstanding question is, does the schools rank, um, those schools that rank highest in primary care on the US, US News and World Report rankings, do they have the highest percentage of students completing global health ex um, experiences? And just for a list of that, you can see that there's not a lot of overlap between the top 10 research institutions and the top 10 primary care institutions. And one might posit or ask, is there a difference in global health experiences at the research institutions versus the primary care institutions? Or is this a pre-selection bias that those institutions are bringing? Also in education, there's definitely an intersection between education and the primary care ranking and community outreach. And it's really the top, this segues into the topic of health equities or healthcare disparities and how global health can increase a learner's likelihood to serve an underserved population. So another question that I would pose to you is should global health programming stand alone or should we collectively be coordinating or embracing the broader picture of healthcare equities as the overriding umbrella for global health? Okay, moving on to research. When you speak with your dean about the potential for global health to interface in research, 
perspectives may seem pretty bleak right now. In our current political climate of nationalism, we're definitely seeing a decrease in USAID and PEPFAR funding, um, as well as NIH funding. Um, Fogarty grants are still available, and we can definitely see that the Fogarty grants have been studied and are building blocks for the successful research careers in global health. But one of the things that we can definitely see is that global health tends to um, allow or encourage interdisciplinary research work. This in and of itself for deans is a marker of success of a research program, to be able to have interdisciplinary um, cooperation and involvement. My personal experience has led me into a number of multidisciplinary projects that are not only health related, but are looking really to improve the community and society as a whole. So they're typically health is one of the five prongs that are looking at community development and improvement. And the others are uh, water, food, energy, and education. So being able to take a much more holistic and not only even interdisciplinary, but interspecialty uh, view of it. Other um, research groups um, nationally are, are actually spearheaded through nursing, through vet med, public health, pharmacy, optometry, and when they seek out medical partners, are you the people that they reach to, and how can you personally increase your research just as a, a, a sideline of that? So when it comes to research, the opinion of other deans and program directors matters. All of this can spread the name of your home institution and subsequently influence the opinions of other program directors or deans, increasing the peer assessment and the reputation for those rankings. Uh, when the dean focuses on clinical care, she or he will clearly know what the national markers of clinical care are at the institution. The uh, Accountable Care Organization, or NISQIP, the National uh, Surgical Quality Improvement Program, these are all important determinants to track the quality of care. But equally importantly, healthcare equities, as we alluded to earlier, um, also known as disparities of care, um, is coming to the forefront as a priority for socially responsible institutions. The natural tie between delivering health care um, to the socioeconomically disadvantaged in low and middle income countries and regional and local health equities is clear. Um, as this study by uh, Citrin really highlights, um, global health academic partnerships are centered around a core tension. They often mirror or reproduce the very cross uh, national inequities they seek to alleviate, but that can worsen power dynamics that perpetuate health disparities. On the other hand, they form an essential response to the need for healthcare resources to reach marginalized populations. Um, so just being mindful of that schism or that tension dynamic, I think, is important. Uh, lastly, from a clinical care perspective, global health has a key role in really preparing ourselves for local challenges of emergency preparedness, endemic control. Unfortunately, this is kind of an all or none sell to the deans. You don't need it until you need it. And when you need it, you really need it. Um, but certainly, uh, we will find our academic institutions and country at large at risk for the next pandemic unless we develop some of these relationships. By definition, community engagement and global health go hand in hand. We're really experts at partnership and outreach, and the mainstay of the majority of global health initiatives is health advocacy. So, Question, if we have an interest in international medicine or global health, what role do we have in caring for local refugee populations within our own city? And does that expand the university's um, mission and goal in health equities? So do refugee clinics, should they really fit under our curricular structure? 
given the cultural competence and expertise that global health experiences afford our faculty and learners. Does this answer the Dean's mission and goals in community outreach as well? Cultural competency and diversity are central themes of global health programs, but the direct connectivity of the strengths in global health and its learners, faculty and staff, and being able to recruit diverse personnel has really yet to be explored. Focusing back on health equities, a necessary component of health equities is the decentralized learning environment that they require. How can we leverage the key components of successful curriculum development in a decentralized model and apply it locally to answer regional health equities or disparities of care? For instance, does being an institutional leader in global health uniquely prepare you to develop learner curricula around underserved populations locally? And would you be the natural choice for university leadership to turn to in developing off-site educational experiences regionally and locally? The article quoted here specifically speaks to cultural competency being addressed as one of the core competencies in global health education. Although it, uh, cultural competency is alluded to in many specialties assessment milestones, the focus on specific assessment of cultural competency within the structure of global health is both deliberate and clear. Another untapped area of research focuses on the link between cultural competency, global health interest, and faculty and student diversity. As I look at the audience here today, the question is, do we represent the patient population the same way that the House of Medicine and Academics represents the patient populations? that we serve. And if we are a better representation of patient population, then does that speak to the diversity that global health promotes? Is this something that is a, an area that's ripe for study? I would certainly argue that the answer to that is yes. And then as far as infrastructure and leadership, Certainly the dean is responsible for the budget. It's really a, a key area for you to be mindful of when you're asking the dean for any resources. But it also means developing good relationship with trainees, faculty, staff, and alumni. And my question for you is, have you maximally used this as a point of leverage in your academic centers? What makes good financial health of global health programs sustainable? Very few studies have examined how established global health programs have achieved sustainability. Um, the objective of this study stated uh, was to describe the financial status of global health programs. Um, and in general, these programs are financially solvent when a complex formula is used to look at their impact in all of these different areas. But how many of your student cohorts um, do you have block off time to have lunch with the dean? Uh, to tell her or him about the global health experience that's, that they've had? How many faculty in your institutions know of parallel efforts that their colleagues, even outside of their own department, may have in global health? Has there been a forum to share those lessons learned and initiatives? Has the dean been invited? Have you queried your alumni about the formative aspects of their global health experience? And have the alumni been approached as donors specifically for global health initiatives to fund those experiences for current learners? All of these opportunities can really foster professionalism, diversity, positive work, and a positive learning environment. So we come back to the original question that I stated. Who is your dean with a capital dean? And to be kind of antagonistic to this, the core of the question is, does it matter? Many offices of global health sit under the auspices of the medical school and under the auspices of the dean. 
But the difficulty in doing that is our funding is provided on a year-to-year -year basis. And if we're really looking at the financial viability and the learner impact and the faculty satisfaction of a program, we need to have a commitment to more sustained funding. And that may need to ascend beyond our colleges of medicine to a university level. And integrating ourselves into the university mission and the university plans, long range st strategic plans, may do more for global health viability within the medical community than anything else. So in this spirit, there have um, actually since 2009, there are now 41 universities in North America that have an interdisciplinary center dedicated to global health. These institutions and their partners can help to achieve the greatest long-term impacts of global health initiatives. So the question is, who is your dean? Have you talked to your dean? Does she or he know what's going on? And who is your dean's boss? And is that the point of education that we need to have to really develop some sustainable models of global health in academia today? Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And my email is up there. This is for you. Oh, thank you. you going in the airplane oh, with a heavy thing is annoying, but it's that's really That's beautiful. Pretty. Oh, gosh. No, that's beautiful. I'll find room for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of other things since we have the time. Since we've been talking about the fact that this is a CAMES third year, um, if you have ever had the chance to look in our bylaws, you see that at the end of the third year, we are starting our fellowship. So there's a few people who are qualified for fellowship who um, applied. It was no judging. They have simply sent in their application. They had enough points. And as a result of it, they got it. Uh, so, so if you'll see them, they're going to have these cute little pins on. We're not making a whole big deal about it, but I thought I would just announce it, and people can stand, and you can see. So, um, and no particular order. It's just how it happens to be in my file. Uh, the first one is Richard Sharp. Uh, Stanislav Stawicki. Manish Garg. I said it wrong. Thomas Papademus, uh, Harry Anderson, um, not present today, um, Michael Furstenberg, and Mamta Swoop, and me, Bonnie Nicole. Um, if, if you qualify for it, it's on the website fellowship. He didn't send in his paperwork. Um, so um, you can just apply again. There's no round robin thing. But um, uh, so the minute you get to that point, and if you didn't have time to do the paperwork, even though I sent you reminders multiple times, we'll still take them. And um, so it's one of just the kind of little added benefits of a K membership. So um, we're going to take a, we're going to, if you look at your programs, which I had great interest in having them go into your little packet thing because then it would be easy. Um, so this is Lecture Hall 1, and it will be continuing here in this room after the break. And um, the second session will be in Lecture Hall 1A, which is slightly down the hall. The um, snacks and breaks, um, and we're having the, the snack and break. Um, oh. There's one other thing. I don't know if you, uh, you saw it, but Litecoin is one of our sponsors. And so we will be handing out random tokens. Uh, you go online and you figure it out. They're worth anywhere from $0.10, cents, two, cent, $0.02 cents to $100. So yeah, I don't know what you're going to get. 
Um, we will be, we've got a lot of them. They're a wonderful sponsor. And then we will be handing them out, especially at the end of sessions, in order to make sure that people sort of, I don't know, come at the end or stay till the end. Um, Christina, do you have any announcements? Oh, 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 oh. Joel, stand up. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Joel. Happy birthday to you. Oh, I'll do it again. Um, just so everybody knows, Dr. Gernsheimer is probably responsible for 60% of the board certified emergency physicians in New York, much less the United States. In one way or another, most of us are connected to him. So I think it also set, says a huge um, a compliment to the fact that he's been spending his birthday with us rather than, but he's not staying for dinner. But, so anyway, but thank you, Joel, for training us all. He was my program director. <laughs> Sorry, one last announcement is since we're ahead of schedule a little bit, which is amazing, we're going to go ahead and start the next session in lecture hall in here at 11 o'clock instead of at 11.15. So you'll still have plenty of time for break, but we'll give it a little extra time for our sessions. Okay? All right. I made a mistake. He sent it. Okay. And don't forget, if you're interested in joining a came, we have a special discounted rate this weekend, only valid this weekend. Uh, and you can find out how to sign up at the front desk. Thanks. <laughs>